was, it was. So on our way out, uh, one of the rescuers actually thanked us for getting stuck because he said we, that they hadn't had a call out for about three months. I think really the reason why I joined the, the rescue team was because by the very nature of my work I always found that I happened to be there on rescues and it sort of seemed to grow on me that and eventually uh, I, I don't quite know whether I asked or they asked me but they decided that uh, as I was always there it might be a good idea for me to be with them. Well I was misled you see, I, I joined it for the money because Dickie Oldman said there was money in it, so I joined, and I've since found out that it's still the way around. All you do is pay out, isn't it? But, uh, I, d I joined because doing a certain amount of potholing, it seemed the obvious thing to do, to be able to help other people if they were really going to get stuck. Brother-in-law always used to be rushing off on these rescues, and I uh, just wondered one day what it would be like to go with him. I just watched him one day, they started coming out of a pothole, and I thought, what would I do with this? That's what I pothole is a little bit difficult, that's maybe why we go, you try to do something that the ordinary man in the street might not do and maybe that's where you get a kick out of doing it. Uh, you don't just go because it's there, that's a cryptic little saying where we go because it's there, but uh, you don't go because it's there, you go um, just I think basically to be a little bit different from the man next door. My first call out, it was uh, it was one Sunday evening and I'd only just been accepted into the into the team. The phone call went, the voice at the other end said, to the police, call out, want you straight away. And I'll never forget that and collie bubbles in my tummy. It uh, all, all the way up, I was dashing up in the car to try and get there and join the other boys. All the way up I was sort of thinking, will I be able to do it? Will I be good enough? Will I be able to sort of keep up with the other lads, because of course, on your first one, you don't know why, quite uh, what to expect. But when I got there, I found it was all right, nobody else, uh, you sort of piled in with the lads and you did uh, what job you had to do, and, and that was it. Well, I can't remember it too well, but I know that uh, first, first of all, there was, uh, uh, I was very excited to start with, that, that uh, I should be called out to go on a rescue. Um, Apart from that, I can't remember much about it, actually, because it all went so fast after that. I was scared to death, quite honestly. And like Ted, I was looking forward to getting there and seeing what I could do, but unlike Ted, when I got there, I found I could do nothing right. Well, the first thing I knew about my first good night, one Sunday night, I said, oh, that'll be a foul rescue call-out. My wife said, oh, what's that? Are you a member of the team? I didn't know anything about it. So, we lumbered up, got some food ready, and... Another friend came in and said, Oh, well, I've been on these doors before. We shan't be doing anything for hours. I should bring a book to read. We set off, got up there. We were only up there five minutes. And they said, Oi, come on, away you go. And that was it. We were way down. At the time we, um, we realised that we were going to be rescued, um, our main worry obviously went towards our parents. The strain and the stress they would be going through. Um, and then secondly, um, I suppose our worry was the fact that uh, we were calling out and inconveniencing the, um, the fell rescue teams. Come on, 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 come on
you know, about to the what same see you ten hours after, half an hour. Oh yeah, come in now, fetch one flask of soap and send three of you. You get lost two two halfway in and away you go. You come down later on, you come across the if a god stood waiting somewhere, you find a patient. I think you've got to bear in mind, Norman, that as Robbie says, if, if you lads weren't outside, the lads couldn't be inside. My thoughts all the time they were climbing up to us was that uh, we should receive a real rocket from them, but this was not so. Their only concern was for our welfare. Um, they had brought hot soups with them, which they handed out freely to us. I think that one of the worst jobs is if you're on the telephone. Those infernal machines which we have then, when you're sat in the dark, you usually turn your light off to conserve mm -hmm. your lamp. And suddenly you're probably sat on a little ledge or wet through, shivering away, and suddenly you'll hear a and it, it just suddenly leaps out of the darkness at you and it sort of brings you, up, brings you back to your senses and you answer the phone. Probably have to shout down above the noise of all the water rushing past you. And well, you know what the people who you're rescuing must feel like, didn't they? Because they've been waiting a lot longer in the dark. I was hoping this, if you can imagine, uh, standing against that wall with another wall and a rope round you, up into the top. And the most vivid impression when I looked up, and Donald shouted, he got to know my name, you see, he didn't know me from Adam. But he got to know my name from the other lands and he came and said, hello, Callan, you see, and I looked up and all I could see was two great bloody big glasses. And it, it looked like a, some peculiar, it looked like a, a big rat, because you couldn't see anything, you see. And I thought, good God, what's this? And of course, um, I was very tired and you might be miles away. <laughs> and that's, the, that's the, most, the first thing I thought. decided which we better turn back. We then realised that we'd, or one or two of us realised with all the difficult, terrible travels to go through again, uh, if we'd have known of course that we could have walked in the water all the way it would have made it far easier but we, we didn't know this and we, we went back and we had to push ourselves along all the way back again on backs and knees. And it was there that I uh, asked my grip once and they ended up in the water. And uh, I was only too thankful that there was, no, it was just water underneath. Ran back up to where the others were and we set off again. And it was all this second pushback through the terrible travels that must have really exhausted us all. Me more, far more than the others. We got back to Gypsum Travels and had a rest. Then carried on to the start of Hardy's Horror and it was there that uh, the first two of the party got through. And uh, I was the third, try, try again, and uh, it didn't come off and it ended up with me being getting to the point of no return, having slithered down between the two rock faces.
people have to be reasonably fit exposure and the comparatively long time they're likely to be underground. I think this is a much bigger factor than the actual sheer physical strength involved. I think there is sometimes when sheer physical strength counts, if a very hard bit of climbing has to be done, sheer physical strength matters. Anyway, I just took the rope from around me, I slid down, my pants fell off, but I, I was wearing swimming trunks and I walked out just in my swimming trunks. The most vivid impression that left upon me, one bloke very ardently tried to carry me on his side. Great camaraderie, everybody wanted to help, must touch the body. One bloke was running alongside me saying, Good God, I've been on about 15 rescues, never, never actually seen the fellow who's been rescued. Can I carry you? <laughs> you see, all I wanted to do was carry me. And it was really funny, was this? He kept running on saying, I've helped at someone, never been so near a fellow who's been rescued. How do you feel, you see? And uh, they rigged me up with a lamp, of course, which was again banging my back. But this chap said, oh, I'll carry you. And of course, he just put one arm around me. And uh, this again just, I said, do you mind, I'll walk. And which they let me do until I got to the entrance of the cave. And I just happened to trip as I was going and about ten pair of arms came out and picked me up and bodied and lifted me. Some people say that the most uh, vivid and lasting impressions always come back to you at this point. Well, nothing came back to me at all. It, just, it was just nice and peaceful. Believe it or not, I felt warm, I was comfortable. Uh, it was more like a stilling of the senses and we uh, were able to talk if I wanted to uh, and that's what we did. I don't know how long we waited for Donald from the time that Graham sent out uh, a message saying we wanted a rope to try and get me around this. We, we couldn't get, the only thing we was to do was to try and pull me back and go over the top, which we found we could have done afterwards. It was a good idea. But uh, from the time that we gave this message, it can't have been very long because we were already at the cave mouth. So we'd left somebody outside who had been camping who would come up with us and when we hadn't come out, they called the rescue team out that they'd gone to Providence Pot before they'd come to our cave, thinking we'd be further through than we were. They didn't realise we'd come back. One of the main problems, of course, is 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 what you do when you when you've been working all night on a rescue and you get back to you get back home about half past six in the morning and lads like the farmers and some of the other people, of course, they've got to sort of turn straight out to work. That is if they can. But one of the points is, of course, that quite often you, you're so completely exhausted that you just must go to bed. You couldn't possibly go to work, and that is, is one of the problems whereby. Some of the lads, of course, tend to lose money. We lose brass. It's as simple as that. Well, I've got a bit of an arrangement, but uh, it's not indefinite, unfortunately. Oh, well, I've got a father, and he's the worst thing of all. He come home and he, he plays hell, but definitely forget it, and away you go. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if the rescue is finished, say, at half past six in the morning, um, nobody's going to say anything uh, if I don't go to work for another half day and the thing I reckon to do is to get as much sleep as I need to be able to work effectively when I go to work. If it finishes at half past six I'll probably get four hours sleep and start work at eleven in the morning. Do you remember about David Prox the first time he led? It was unfortunately it was a fatal accident. And by the time we got him out of cot, it was pretty, it was pretty late. And the next morning, Dave didn't turn in for work until a little bit later. And what had happened was that one of his workmates on the way down to work had been leaning over somebody else's shoulder, reading the paper, and seen the headlines 
man dies in pothole. And underneath was a photograph of David Proctor. Unfortunately, he couldn't read the, the small type which said he led the rescuers. And when David arrived in for work about an hour and a half later, they'd had a collection for him. Unfortunately, he never got the money. They took it back all back again. Well, a lot of that do a perfect job of that, but we can usually reduce the water level to make it safe for us to go in ourselves. And as an extra precaution, we have telephone lines down the cave, and uh, we could be immediately told if that waters were coming up again. After seven hours huddled together by candlelight, we heard voices in the stream some 70 feet below us. We all shouted together. It was then they came across the rope which we had lowered by as a marker to guide uh, the rescuers to us. We then realized that we had been found and it only remained then to sit tight and wait for two of the party to climb up to us. Um, this they did, um, it took them half an hour to do it. When we eventually got to the entrance there was, uh, there was such a reception, we, we never expected uh, seeing quite so many people, they'd set up a, a radio post to be in contact with the other end and their uh, headquarters. Um, there was a roaring fire, field kitchens with hot soups and uh, food ready for us. Um, parents waiting there, cigarettes all over the place. Uh, we didn't realise it would cause so much of a stir. And this was one thing, as Eric said, um, we were pretty concerned about um, the inconvenience, the fact that they'd all be called out. But as it turns out, I think they were rather pleased and. Uh, uh, I can just imagine, imagine them sitting at home on Sunday afternoons over their telephones waiting for the things to ring. Do you remember that time when they'd been out on a, a practice, a fairly vicious practice all day, and we all got back to the hut in the evening, and then suddenly before we'd even got a chance to to go to go home and even get ch changed into dry clothes. And we got Sergeant dashing across to tell us that it was a call out. I find that uh, that when I get wet through and uh, muddy and black all over. I wonder, why ever do I do this? But uh, I think I'll never do it again. But the next rescue, there I am, ready to go again.